sing uh, from Psalm 100 this morning as we enter into his courts. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Come worshiping before the throne of God. For the Lord, he is good, and his love endures forever.
Lord is good and his love endures forever. So I guess we should respond to that then, right? We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb. We fall. Thank you. 
only one to be exalted. Amen. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you As we prepare to take the Lord's table together and participate in communion, and we think about how much it is worth knowing Christ, Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3 just how much knowing Christ is worth to him. In verse 7, he writes, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that depends on, that from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ, that he is exalted above all things, all of creation, and that you have given him authority over all of it. And Lord, we recognize that whatever zeal we have, whatever work we've done is counted as nothing before you. Because the only way that we have a right relationship with you is by the righteousness we gain through faith in Christ. And to know him and to know the fellowship of his sufferings as we go about this world is the greatest joy and the greatest value that we can find in this life. So Lord, as we await the day when we anticipate the resurrection like his own, Father, I pray that you would purify our lives and that we would press toward the mark that you have for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Father, as we remember his death and resurrection and the elements that we're about to take, and the promise that it brings of our salvation com being completed with our resurrection. I pray that you would help us to reflect and see where it is that we do not value you as we ought. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
As we prepare to hear the text that Pastor Wayne will be preaching this morning, let's go ahead and stand together as we read it in John chapter 3, verse 22. John chapter 3, verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into Judea, the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness, bear me witness, that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has, been, who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He who he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the testimony of John and the example that he sets before us. That it is Christ who must be exalted and it is us who must step aside and proclaim his glory, recognizing that he is the Christ. Lord, you have given all authority to our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is with that that we pray in his name, asking you to have the same mind that John has. Recognizing that it is only through Christ that we can be saved and not ourselves. So, Father, I pray this morning that the people in this room would be granted your spirit without measure in such a way that they could believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we just experienced another election this week and uh, still don't know exactly the direction Americans want our country to go as one party has a majority in the House, the other party a majority in the Senate, and both parties have claims to the executive branch, which means the outcome may be determined by the judicial branch. And the battle for control will likely continue for years to come, with many having no idea what to believe, as politicians have been caught lying, cheating, stealing, the media has been caught censoring what the country hears about it, and not only our airwaves uh, through the major networks, but even the social media has been caught censoring, which is not uncommon in other countries, especially those governed by a Marxist approach. But what does this have to do with us? We are citizens of this country, yet our citizenship, our true citizenship, is in another kingdom. So regardless of who our mayor is, or our governor, or our senators, or our president, and certainly those individuals have a major impact on our culture. They have a major impact on our economy, on our environment, on our laws. But regardless of who they are, or what they do, to be honest with you, they have no impact on who I am or my purpose in life. None. You know, during the days of the early church, the emperor and his governors falsely accused Christians of all kinds of things and arrested them and imprisoned them and even put them to death. 
But they could not stop them from being what Christ had called them to be. Christ had promised the gates of hell will not prevail. And that was true then. And it was true throughout the Dark Ages. It was true throughout the Reformation. It was true throughout the American Revolution. It was true throughout our Civil War. It was true throughout both world wars. And it is still true today. Who we are, our calling, our purpose in life, is not determined by our political or our cultural circumstances. This world is by nature spiritually dead. It dwells in darkness. And so no shenanigans of men should ever surprise us. The question is, how should we respond? Who we are? What should we do? And that's what our text deals with today. Following his encounter with Nicodemus, Christ and his disciples go into the Judean countryside and they begin baptizing. It says that John the Baptist goes north near Salim, where there is much water. And we know this region had about seven springs that uh, might give us some indication, some insight as to the mode or method for water baptism in that day. It doesn't appear that they were sprinkling or pouring, but they were immersing individuals for repentance. Now, the location for Anon is believed to be in Samaria near Beth Sheon, where King Saul had been executed a thousand years earlier, in a thousand BC. Now, what significance does this detail have? Why does he tell us Christ goes south to the Judean countryside, John the Baptist goes north to Samaria? Why? Well, it seems to indicate that John's not competing with Christ. He goes to a totally different area, seemingly with the intent of sending his new disciples to Christ. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, keep reading, and you'll see that. Now, before we go on, someone is going to say, you know, just 16 verses later, it says that Christ himself was not baptizing. Is this a contradiction in chapter 4 to verse 22 in chapter 3? Well, no. No, it's not at all a contradiction. I mean, John's not going to contradict himself within 16 verses. I mean, the Holy Spirit will not allow that no matter how imperfect John's humanity might be. John's simply clarifying that Christ is doing the teaching and his disciples are doing the baptizing. I mean, can you imagine how much bragging could go on if this were not the case? So you were baptized by, by James or by John or by Peter or by Andrew. Well, Christ himself baptized me. He said, well, that kind of thing is kind of foolish. Well, it went on in that day. It still goes on to this day. Paul says to the church at Corinth, I thank God... I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Why? Because I don't want anyone saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas. This is not a contradiction. This is a clarification. Christ is teaching the disciples are baptizing. And notice another important detail. This occurs before John the Baptist is put into prison. Now, why does he mention that? Well, if you are familiar with your gospel records in Matthew, Mark, Luke, which have been in circulation now for 25, 30, 35 years, they all begin with the ministry of Christ after John is imprisoned. Now, you remember Herodias? You remember Herodias, how she influenced her husband, Herod Antipas, to arrest John the Baptist and then to behead him? Why? The reason is John had rebuked the king for divorcing his wife and marrying his brother's wife. Now you got to understand, Herodias was his older brother's daughter. He had an older brother named Aristobulus. This is his daughter. So she is his niece. And she had married one of his other brothers, Philip. So she was not only his niece, she was his sister-in-law. Now, Herodias, which is the feminine form of the word Herod, was his niece and his sister-in-law when she became his wife. And John says this incest is pathetic. And he lost his head over it. 
So he sets the record straight. John does. What is taking place in today's text was all before John was arrested. This is during the time that John is in Samaria calling Jews to repentance and administering this symbol of cleansing called baptism. And a Jew asked some of his disciples about this matter of purification. Now you've got to keep in mind that a Jew was very careful to cleanse his hands before he ate. And if he touched anything dead, he had to go through this whole purification ceremony. So here's the question. In our religion, it calls for a cleansing whereby we wash, we wash our hands from the tips of our fingers all the way to our elbows. And we're very meticulous about this ritual for purification. So let me ask you this. Why this total immersion of the body? Why are you here baptizing people, their whole body under water? Why are you doing that? And the answer would have been, well, you know, once, for one's soul to be cleansed, repentance has to occur. And that is what this symbol in water is representing, a total cleansing from head to toe. All right, well, I get that. Now, do you realize, though, that the guy down in Judea, the one that you bore witness to, do you realize that after you said he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, do you realize that more and more and more and more Jews are going after him instead of you? See, John was this bright, shining star within Israel. I mean, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets and the first to speak the word of the Lord in 400 years. He's the guy who's drawing so many Jews to the wilderness for his message of repentance and for his symbol of baptism that, that is a symbol for cleansing. So many, the Sanhedrin, you remember, sent out a delegation that asked, are you the Christ? Are you the prophet? Are you Elijah? Who are you? You're obviously somebody very important. But now, but now there's another who is garnering a lot more attention than you, John. How do you feel about that? And his answer reveals his perspective. Number one, why is John not threatened by the increased popularity of Christ? That's the first point. You know, preachers can get, eh, can get their feelings hurt. I mean, they're human, right? I'll confess, I personally liked Charles Stanley. I liked to listen to him until I learned that he's my wife's favorite preacher. And, you know, his books are fine, and he's done a good job down there. But to be honest with you, he's not that dynamic. I just don't see what she sees. Some see the Jews trying to stir up this kind of competition. How do you feel about that, John? How do you feel about the new guy being more popular than you? And John's answer, and, and if you take notice of this, I think this should be true of us as well. I know it should be true of us as well. Our calling and our purpose in life comes from above. And this is what I am called to do. This was the whole purpose for my birth. I already told you, I am not the Christ. I'm not the one who will die to the just wrath of God for your sins. I'm the one called to prepare the way for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. My life is not about me. The divine purpose for my birth was to be like a bright shining star at night in a world of darkness. But when the sun comes, I fade into the background. And to be honest with you, that's my goal here. I want you to know Christ. And I don't care if I'm your favorite preacher. I'm not that good a speaker. I know that. As long as you come to love the Lord, as long as you come to grow in his word, as long as you come to serve him with perseverance, as long as you come to, to this place and receive the injection of truth, divine truth, 
and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and you get to the end and you hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, that's all that matters to me. It really doesn't make any difference whether you remember me or anything about me. Because the only significance I have has to do with how well I point you to Christ. And how much the Lord approves, whether or not he approves of what I do and how I do it. I mean, this was the whole purpose for my being born. And I didn't even know it when I was growing up. I mean, from the earliest days that I can remember, my great-grandmother used to say, I pray your preaching might save many souls. I can remember that as far back as when I was five years old. I had no idea what she was talking about. In the fifth grade, when I got thrown out of church for, for fighting during vacation Bible school, the teacher said, don't come back if you're going to act like that. And I didn't. I didn't. I didn't go back for years. I finally started going back as a junior in high school, another church. Became a Christian as a senior in high school. Went away to college. Had my life continue to be transformed there into where I ended up going to seminary. And then I ended up going into ministry. And my first Sunday in the pulpit, I preached from Genesis 6. Still remember the outline very well to this day. And when I was preaching that message, my great-grandmother, my first sermon, my great-grandmother was sitting in the pew right in front of me. Big smile on her face. 92 years old. And she died shortly after that. After she saw the answer to her prayers. John recognizes this. He rec there is no way in the world I'm upset over Christ drawing bigger crowds than me. He is the whole purpose for my life. If it were not for him, there would be no reason for me. That's his first point. Secondly, I understand my purpose is to be the shashpin. Now, you got to remember, weddings in that day, uh, a lot of times it could take up to a year to get ready for them as the, as the groom would go off to begin to prepare for this very significant celebration. And so he had this shashpin. The weddings themselves uh, could last up to a week. And so the groom had his shashpin, his best man. His closest friend, the guy who was responsible for making all the plans for the celebration of this sacred event, the guy who would communicate with his bride that would bring her to connect her to him. He was the one that was responsible for the preparation of presenting her to the groom. And John says, that's my job. That's my job. And if I do a good job of fulfilling my purpose, that brings indescribable joy to my life. I mean, no best man, and here's his point, a best man does not take the place of the groom. I mean, that's one of the basic rules of society, is it not? You don't try to marry your best friend's bride. This is what enraged Samson in Judges 14. His wife was given to his best man. I don't care what culture you're in. You don't do that. That's a major no-no. I mean, when the bride is coming down the aisle, the best man is not to be winking at her. When they go to the reception, he doesn't break into the first dance. He doesn't make a request, can I go and cut the cake with you? No, this is not your day. This is not your bride. This is not your wedding. The bride is for the groom. You're not to be a part of the honeymoon. The bride and groom are one with each other. And this is a good point that we need to remember. All of us who are in ministry together here within this body. We need to remember this. That our small groups are not about us. Our role in ministry is not about us. Whatever it is that we are doing within this body, within this church, is not about us. We are nothing more than shashpins. Whose job it is, is to connect the bride, the church, with the groom, Christ. 
if what we're doing within the church becomes more about us than it is about Christ, we've missed the whole purpose for why we are doing it. John says, I'm glad to see disciples following Christ. I mean, that's the whole reason for my ministry of calling men to repentance is seeing them follow Christ. That's what brings me great joy. I consider it an honor just to participate. I consider it an honor to be a shashman, to prepare the way, to connect the bride to the groom. It gives my life meaning and purpose and direction because my life is not about me, it is about him. Third point. The first law of Christian ministry is humility. Once we are born again in Christ, he must increase, we must decrease. That's why any preacher who just tries to entertain his people on Sunday to keep the crowds coming, you don't want to offend anybody. That is ministerial adultery. What he says, the preacher, how he says it, the message itself is not to be how to make a better you. It's not to be, look at how entertaining I am. See, that's spiritual incest. Trying to get the bride to look at you instead of turning them to Christ. That's spiritual incest. If the message is not connecting the church to the, to the groom, if people are not saying when they leave, wow, Christ is an awesome Savior. It is the goal of my life to live as, as much as I possibly can that he might glorify himself through me, through who I am, through what I do. That's the goal of my life. If that's not what you're saying when you leave here, then something is wrong. If that isn't happening, then the church, that church, has become a victim of ministerial adultery. Because we are like stars, bright and shining in the midst of spiritual darkness. But as our proclamation of Christ causes the light of God's truth to dawn in the lives of others, we ought to see him increasing as we, as the need for us, continues to decrease. And here's why this is important. John gives you four reasons. And if you get this right, there's going to be joy that comes from seeing Christ increase in the lives of others, regardless of what our circumstances are, regardless of what happens out there. And I, I think that we as parents ought to be able to understand this, can't we? I mean, I brought my children up in the admonition of God's word, and nothing brings me greater joy than to see them no longer relying on me but going to God's word for truth. And out of their love for Christ, they are bringing up my grandchildren in his word. And with all of my faults, I will continue to decrease as Christ continues to increase in their lives. And they fulfill their divine calling. They fulfill their purpose in life. And when that happens, I experience great joy, great joy regardless of what they do for a living, regardless of where they live or how much money they make, if they are living for Christ, eternity is ours together. And what greater joy could I possibly have than to know that truth? In verse 31, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. But he who comes from heaven is above all. I mean, John's point is this. As one born on earth, he can only speak from a personal perspective of things that he has witnessed and experienced on earth. But he's saying Christ is not just a man who entered this earth by natural means. He is eternally pre-existent. Therefore, he has no equal. He is above all others who have ever walked on this planet. Men born on earth have human mothers and human fathers. Therefore, they speak about the, the things that humans can sense and perceive and can reason through. But you know, they cannot speak from a first-hand perspective about eternity. They can't talk to you about God's holiness. 
from a personal perspective. They can't talk to you about God's justice or goodness or mercy or grace. They have no firsthand knowledge regarding the reality of those heavenly truths. So it really doesn't matter how great my calling in life might be. I in no way can rival Christ. That's why he must increase and I must decrease. Verse 32. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Christ being eternally divine doesn't speculate. He's got firsthand knowledge of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He has firsthand knowledge of how all things were created and why they were created. He understands the, the true nature of evil as an ontological parasite on the holiness of God. He knew Adam and Eve better than Adam and Eve knew themselves because he created them. He knows what they did in the garden. He has firsthand knowledge of what led to the flood. What led to the creation of nations. What led to the rebellion at Babel. He has firsthand knowledge of the call of Abraham, of the creation of Israel, of the call of Moses, of the establishment of David. He's not only omniscient about all of life and the purpose for life. He is sovereign over all of that. Over all that he created. Yet man in his fallen nature is so spiritually dead, he will reject those eternal truths. That Christ reveals about how the creation occurred. About why history is moving towards a day of accounting. He will reject the very idea of an eternal existence of all men into either heaven or hell. And while man in his foolishness and ignorance, I mean, why they will buy books from people who supposedly died and came back to life and will believe that stuff? Why they will go see movies by Dan Brown speculating on some code that the Gnostics claim to exist? I mean, why do men do that kind of stuff? And yet there is a Bible laying right there. Right there on the shelf, collecting dust. And they refuse to read it, refuse to believe it. Refuse to, to accept what one who from heaven has said about what it is like to die and to return from the grave. And what exists into eternity because he has come from eternity. Whoever receives his testimony... Sets his seal to this, that God is true. You know, if only a man would pick up his Bible and read it, they would know the truth about God and about man and about sin and about salvation. They would see that everything the Lord has proclaimed is true. I mean, did the Lord not promise Israel that he would deliver them from Egypt? And he did it. Did the Lord not promise that if they obey his law, he would bless them? And did he not do that? Did he not say, if you rebel against my holy word, you will suffer consequences? And did that not happen? Did he not promise to deliver them from Babylon and do exactly what he said? The 355 prophecies that he gave us about the Redeemer to come, were not all of those fulfilled in Christ? Why? Because one of the things the Lord cannot do, he can't do it, is lie. His holy character will not allow it. What he says, he does. The psalmist said, the entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. That's why when the angel said to Mary, a virgin, this child is Emmanuel, God with us. That was the truth. Uh, when John the Baptist heard the Lord say, this is my beloved, beloved son, listen to him. This was the truth. It was the truth. Anyone who says, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Christ, is calling the Lord a liar. Any Jew who says, I believe in God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I reject Christ, is calling God a liar. Any Muslim who says, I don't believe Christ is the Son of God, is calling the Lord a liar. All of the liberals, all of the liberals out there, 
And there are bunches of them in seminaries and in churches all across this land who say, I believe in God, but reject the 355 prophecies revealed in the incarnation and atoning death of Christ, confirmed by his resurrection, are calling God a liar, a liar. Everyone who claims to be a Christian, but does not bow a knee to Christ as their Lord calls God a liar. And here is why, as John writes in his first epistle, he said, whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God is born concerning the son. He says it again, whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So you can say, I believe in Jesus, but if you are not bowing a knee in repentance to him as Lord, as well as Savior, then you are calling God a liar. That's his point. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Not only is there nothing lacking in Christ as the Word made flesh, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in such perfect harmony that everything Christ is, everything that he says, everything that he does is consistent with everything that is true of the Lord. Because he is the Lord. They are one. He has the authority to lay down his life to destroy sin, Satan, and death and take it up again. He has the authority to return and judge all men according to truth. And he will do that. He has the authority to raise the dead and have them stand before the great white throne. And pronounce righteous judgment upon them. He has the authority to be the fork between heaven and hell. And no one else, no angel, no man, no one else can do that. And so here is his conclusion. Verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Now, why do you think that this verse goes from believes in the Son to obeys the Son? Why is that? Harry Ironside, former pastor of Moody Memorial Church in Chicago, was preaching on this text one time. And um, as the congregation was leaving, he could tell that there was a lady. She was moving very slowly. She had this troubled look on her face. And he asked her what was wrong. And she said, well, I'm just not sure after today's message concerning the condition of my soul, whether or not I am saved. And Harry asked her, he said, well, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Do you believe? She said, yes. He said, then are you saved? She said, well, I hope so. He said, let's go over that text again. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Do you believe? Yes. Are you saved? Well, I hope so. He said, ma'am, he said, your, your problem is you can't spell. He said, when I was in school, the word H-A-S spelt has. You think it spells hope. He who believes in the Son hopes for eternal life. Let me tell you something. I hope, I hope that Harry is right. I hope that it was just a matter of spelling for her. And that it was not a matter of obedience. See, when a man truly believes, he obeys. To put your faith in Christ is to repent. To put your faith in Christ is to trust in his atoning work, which is a transforming experience. To not believe is an act of rebellion. And so you can say one thing, but if you do another, if you're not going to obey, then the wrath of God abides upon you. Which is not a pleasant thought. That's why so many pastors will skip over this verse. But the Lord cannot be holy. He can't be holy. He can't be holy and refuse to deal with immoral rebellion. Otherwise, he would be an immoral God who is complicit with evil. You know, the reason many Christians take the gospel so lightly is they just don't fully understand the impact of the wrath that they are headed towards. You know, years ago they had a program for juvenile delinquents whereby they take troubled teens into hardcore prisons. And these kids who kept getting in trouble before they became adults would walk down those corridors and they would hear these inmates yelling at them. 
hearing these inmates tell them what they want to do to them, would hear these inmates threatening them. And they did that so that these kids would see what is awaiting them if they continue in their life of crime. The program was called Scared Straight. The idea of hell being a place where your friends are, where the party lasts forever, is really foolishness. Truth is, if we could see what it was really like to be a sinner in the hands of a holy God, all of our jokes would end and repentance would begin. So the question becomes, do we really believe? If so, then we know, we know the joy of decreasing as we see him increasing in our life and in the lives of those around us. Christ said of, of John, among those born of women, no one is greater, no one is greater than John the Baptist. Joy that exceeds our circumstances comes from our understanding of our calling and our purpose in life, which is to live to the glory of Christ, regardless of whether Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar or Nero or Hitler or Stalin or whoever is temporarily in power. And as we do that, there is great joy in seeing Christ increasing in the lives of those within our influence. And the more we decrease which really has to do with our humility, the more we decrease, the greater we become. The greater we become, like John the Baptist. Because instead of seeing us, those around us are seeing Christ. And when that happens, I can tell you from seeing this in the lives of my children and seeing it in the lives of my grandchildren, there is a great joy that comes from Christ increasing and our decreasing. And as we do that, we come to understand true greatness. That's the joy of decreasing to greatness. If you'd like to be great, then uh, you'll start living to the glory of Christ and seeing him increase in the lives of others as your need becomes lesser and lesser because they are relying more and more on him and going to him in prayer and in his word. If you'd like to know what that is like, I'll be available all day today and this week, or you can go to the connect table. Stand with me as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and ask that you impress upon all of us your spirit. That by your spirit, the infinite worth of Christ that we might live to the praise and the glory of his name. That is our prayer this day, Lord. For it's in Christ that we ask it. Amen. The words of John are foreshadowed for us in Isaiah chapter 66, which reads, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is the house that you have built for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Let us live this way. You are dismissed.
Thank you.